And welcome to both the training uh, system design interview questions. Um, so first of all, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, and thanks a lot for subscribing to my channel. And I hope um, my videos could help you. And feel free to uh, leave any comments. We can always discuss. And I would actually, I would love everybody to leave some comment to encourage, encourage some discussion so that we both learn something. Um, so, and also this is, as usual, this is our uh, WeChat, both the training WeChat um, QR code, feel free to scan it in your WeChat app. And, uh, oh, one more thing is, uh, so our mock interview is doing, uh, is getting more and more students. So if you have been working for uh, two plus years and already interviewing your current company, feel free to shoot us an email at about the training at outlook.com and we'll get contact with you and we'll see uh, if you, uh, um, I mean, if you want to become interviewer and we'll see whether you're qualified and then uh, we can move forward. Um, our pay is actually pretty well. So, uh, but most, mostly uh, it is for, you know, helping each other and uh, lifting up the community. Okay, so today uh, what I want to talk about is actually a, uh, uh, a presentation that I made almost a year ago. Um, okay, so here's the thing. So the, the main topic for today is I want to talk about basically uh, re they call it resilient engineer or in interviews are more often referred as how do you handle error cases. So here's a big actually a big difference when you're interviewing a junior candidate, junior software engineer versus a uh, uh, more seasoned uh, senior engineers. So when you arch architect a system, so a more senior junior engineers mostly just looking for happy case happy path and to make things work. So um, not really, they, they, might, they may think about the um, scalability issue, but for error cases, so sometimes junior engineer just, oh yeah, it, it's okay. So, or handle errors in a non-resilient way. For senior engineers, you can see, oh wow, they, they basically just architect system so that it's, it, it, it knows failure can definitely happen, it actually will. And uh, the way they handle failures is actually very, uh, very, very elegant, very great. So basically, your system is, is just there, five nights, you know. Um, so I just want to talk about uh, like the reason I brought up Hystrix is Hystrix is from Netflix. Uh, it's a very good uh, error handling like kind of framework. You can utilize this concept in many many interviews, so that you just. Uh, you, you first of all you mentioned the uh, error handling and also you use this you have different ways to handle errors uh, on client side on server side and circuit breaker those kind of things fail fast so all the good principles will come out and you will see oh wow you, you do have experience in large scale systems so, because you will do you will, you will be dealing with failures a um, lot many times um, okay so let's see what history is um, how should I say this? Let's uh, try something different. So basically, um, think about this, right? So whenever you have a system, you have a, this is your client, and then client is making a request to your service. So this service can have multiple machines. Da, 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 multiple machines, right? So every time you make a request, a happy case, everything looks great. You make a request, and then the response looks good. But however, if one of them failed, how do you handle those cases elegantly? And then think about this, because you have multiple multiple clients, and then this server rack can also be scaled. This is like one of your host class, contains many machines, and then you have different host class in different data centers. And how do you handle this efficiently? So we think about this, this question, and now let's go back to his tricks. Uh, so motivation, basically this is from growth mindset, more discussion, that is fine. So what is his trick? His tricks, um, first of all, is this uh, cute little animal right here. Um, because it's very resilient, that's why it's uh, named as his tricks. And uh, this is basically, uh, in short, you can read the slide. In short, it is uh, uh, designed by Netflix. Um, because they are really large scale, as you can see, they, ha they have like 75 million users, 42 billion videos watched in 2015, and heavily depends on AWS. Well, to be honest, AWS uh, handles most of the server side, so that's why Hystrix is more like you know service between service communication. So that's why 
uh, Netflix engineers they develop this to help them because they don't need to care, care about the the real like heavy lifting backend. Um, the goal of Pistrix is isolating points of access between different service, services, stopping cascading failures across them, and provide a fallback options. Uh, caching, monitoring, a bunch of tools will come into out of box for free. Um, so it is uh, what is Hystrix for? Uh, I just mentioned I mentioned it. So it's just basically error handling framework fallback. So it actually here one thing is um, this is just a sidetrack. So normally and also when you design a system, uh, you'll be like, oh, in order to let my system you know keep up and running, so we might enable some throttling. Just keep in mind, the throttling is about protecting the system a bit, a, a little bit like resource management instead of uh, scaling. So if your system can actually scale very well, it probably doesn't really need throttling or your throttle threshold is really high. It never actually gets hit unless somebody is really like malicious, maliciously um, bombarding you with, uh, with a uh, DDoS attack. Or else you should just be scaled horizontally. Um, there's a kind of a, um, this is called a thread pool isolation type of thing. And also the design panel is called bulkhead or swim lane. Uh, because you know everybody has one lane, so your resource, your thread pool is just in this one lane, so everybody gets a fair share. One doesn't, one, one part doesn't really affect another. Uh, why resistance engineering? Just very short because just think about this: doing the calculation. If you have one billion requests per day across all service, so if you have even you have four nights, it's like a two plus hours downtime per month. It, think about this: Netflix two hours per month, people will get mad. Um, so in short, so I will just focus on a few main graphs. This is one of the main graphs I want to focus on. So in short, this graph is, looks like this. So Hystrix is, think about this, they, they build up a command. So uh, you can, in your interviews, you can also say, hey, I have this, uh, you know, I have this over uh, across an uh, organization type of design pattern or, uh, or tools you have to follow. Like for history particular cases, you have to implement a few methods. For example, like you have to implement a few like interfaces, like execute, queue, get fallback, observe, uh, construct or run those interfaces. Essentially, think about this: whenever you send a HTTP request, RPC request, so it has a chance to fail. So basically, whenever it, uh, now the problem is how do you deal with failures? For history um, use cases. First of all, you construct this command, and then you execute. So it will basically send a request to your server. So your server, first thing it will check is whether it is available in the cache or not. So if it is available in the cache, you just directly return yes. However, when when talking about uh, when doing this, we have uh, two general ways of how do we use cache. So let's just table this. I will just continue, and then we'll come back with this cache thing la uh, later. But uh, this is how history is implemented. First of all, a request comes into the server, so you will check the request parameter. For example, if getting your user account. If your user account is already in the cache, great, directly return, green path. If it is not in, available in the cache, it means it has to hit your backend service. So first it will check. So this is a new concept from history. It's called a circuit breaker. So it, it checks whether the circuit breaker is open or not. If the circuit breaker is open, I mean, if open, it means it's, it's not working. So then it will basically goes into this get fallback function because I said over the across the organization everybody has to implement those interfaces. So whenever you're you're writing your own service and then you have this command, for example, uh, I get a credit card information, so I have to implement a callback interface. I could throw not implement in implementation. So see, so now it basically you fill your request. After you fill your request, the circuit breaker status will be. Updated, for example, it's like one request filled out of five. So now you have like twenty percent failure rate. So up to a certain failure rate, a circuit breaker will become open, and uh, this means your service is down. So it won't even even bother to do to go through many more cases. It's like not in cache down. Okay, return false. Return false. This is basically the concept of fail fast. You don't want to waste your resource because every thing about this, if every request. Uh, maybe it's not asynchronous. You can argue in you know, a npm type of thing, uh, Node.js type of thing. But if it is uh, like synchronous, like a classic, you have a thread pool, you have a certain fixed number of threads. You you won't waste a thread because you just uh, feel fast. Always good to feel fast. So now 
uh, you'll get fallback. But normally, for example, you should implement the, uh, you have you should have some kind of uh, uh, local cached results, you know, because those kind of information never really changed, and you have uh, a very a very robust way of get a fallback. For example, you access your Redis cache and then boom, returned everything looks cool, even your database is down. So this is still considered uh, a uh, successful request. So let's say your circuit breaker, this is your open case. If circuit breaker is not open, so it's closed, that means, okay, so you uh, also check the semaphore for thread pool rejected. It means if you exceed your uh, result limit. So this is basically allocating for each of the components that you're calling, uh, because Netflix case is one service might depend on might depend on 50 other services. Think about this, when you open Netflix, that simple page probably spin out like a 100 requests to 100 different microservices or not, uh, or something like that. So it also will check if your resource for certain certain services is, uh, is exceed or not. If it is not exceed, okay, construct a command and run, execute, and then if the timeout or whatever, if it's not timeout, everything looks good, return result, or else just uh, uh, say it's times out and also it will update it will update the circuit technically the circuit breaker health so this also will allow when your circuit breaker is kind of uh, if it is open i believe it will just be open but i think occasionally a good implementation is it will still allow some requests to get in there so if, if maybe it's a transient issue like your network has some issues and then later on it brought bring back to life again so that you don't need to manually uh, interfere this or you just set up an alert and let your engineers manually manually inter interfere this but overall this is the overall architecture so you use cache you use get fallback option you have a circuit breaker if you have to remember something um, so now let's talk about the cache so this way so think about this so um, the way that this one works is when your client side so first of all everything I talk about is on the server side the cache is on cache is on server side this is one way is first you hit your cache if the cache has a result you directly return all else you hit your database let's say boom you hit your database but now you're in the business of uh, uh, validating or invalidating your cache it's like for example it's your user account information my, my nickname let's say is uh, is Bowsy. but later I later on I decided to change it to Bowsy training so then your this is your read request, right? Now, if I have your write request, you have to, first of all, write your DB, update me to Bowsy training from Bowsy, and also from cache, I have to update this as well so that these are consistent. That means your write request is probably going to slow down a little bit, but, um, well, that's the price you have to pay if you're doing it this way. Another way of doing this is more like use cache as a fallback because you don't want... I mean, cache invalidation business is kind of uh, dirty. So many, many, many point, many, and given the fact your service has a very strict SLA, like uh, given this this database service, or normally it's wrapped up into a service called a credit card service, let's say, or account service, has a strict SLA. You just trust the SLA. So all you do is you always hit the account service. So as long as, but this service can have a way to get down right so kind of whenever it's down you you go and hit your cache so if it's not down you just update your cache it's more like you use your cache as your backup so uh, kind of similar as your cache you implement your get fallback option so this is another kind of uh, design to use cache and also of course some some of you might think oh we can also put the cache here right on the client side sure but on the, if you put it on the client side then invalidating or uh, flush the cache is a, is a little bit compli complicated as well because now your client side takes care of the caching and then normally client side should be modern way of design this should, should be stateless so it shouldn't really carry any state like even your server side shouldn't be ever carrying any state except that we have a cache but cache is normally managed like redis memcache for separate clusters so it's still stateless service only stateful is database and your cache okay so if we, like I said, if we want to remember Hystrix, the key take point is first of all has different interfaces, like a fallback. That's get fallback. That's the main thing. And then second, have a circuit breaker concept. Circuit breaker, and third is the cache. Okay.
Um, this is this graph, not official. This is a fine. Basically, the, the most technically, this is challenging, and more technically, more challenging part is how do you play politics, not play politics, but let other teams on board within a large organization. It's also hard. So here's the request flow. I already talked about it. Quick demo is fine. So they have all the tools and metrics. See, it's so nice. And then you have a, you know, if you have a failure request, this circle will grow larger and larger. Um, configure management, they also have it. And also a few concepts you have to to deal with failure is, first of all, you can have some canary, means like your, uh, connect, kind of like your pre-runs, you have some canary with the new code in production. And also a few, another way to doing this canary is like a beam splitter thing, is like when you have a request, you duplicate another request to hit your new services, it's more like resilient engineer or like a test-driven development. How do you basically make your test really, um, make your make sure you have confidence in your new changes. So Comine, so Canary lives in Kuma. Netflix name is pretty interesting. But anyway, this is how you, uh, whenever you get tackled again in, uh, uh, when you did design, uh, you, when you get asked for design questions, you always think about a failure and this is how you can handle failures. So this will definitely distinguish you from like a junior engineer to a senior engineer. All right, guys, thank you a lot for watching. Um, happy New Year, bye.